Hey everyone, my name is Tomato Anus, also known as Needle Peen, and this is an unrestricted Shura ending speedrun of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. This run is actually performed by Little Aggie, the current world record holder for this category, who also worked with me on writing the script to make sure that everything is correct and is as accurate as possible. If you'd prefer to watch this run without commentary or Aggie's world record, there are links in the description below. Also, with this being in the unrestricted category, glitches are allowed, including a pretty major one called air swimming. If you would prefer to watch a no air swim run or a glitchless run, I've linked the current world records for both in the description, respectively ran by Mitriz and Elume. This run is also performed on version 1.02, which is the version from the day one patch of the game's release. This is because there are several glitches and tricks that we're going to use that were patched out, but because version 1.02 is an official release for the game, it's still considered kosher. Also, this game is being ran on PC. When the game begins, our immediate goal is to make it to the Moonview Tower to meet with Kuro, the Divine Heir. This is normally where the game introduces its stealth mechanics to you as you sneak unarmed past a handful of enemies, but sneaking is slow. Instead, we want to head straight to the tower with reckless abandon. During this segment, we don't have the ability to run yet, so we spam jump the whole way because it not only makes us harder to hit for the enemies as we move past them, but it's actually the fastest way to move if you can't run. Similar to sneaking, hanging from ledges and hugging walls is typically slow as well, so we skip it where we can by just double jumping off nearby walls. Once we finish role playing as an action movie star that can slowly move around and not get shot, we arrive at the Moonview Tower and immediately skip a cutscene. After we skipped the cutscene, we received our sword, and I'll be honest, I'm awful at Japanese pronunciation, so I'm going to let text-to-speech handle any names that I find tough. When we received Kusabimaru, we took a knee and talked with Kuro, who gave us a healing gourd, and also said that we must escape Ashina Castle. Our rendezvous spot is a secret passage under a moat bridge. We have to get there first, and then signal to Kuro with a reed whistle. With in hand, we have the ability to sprint and can sprint past all the enemies who have now forgotten about the shinobi who jumped by moments ago. While we sprint, we grab some ash and then make a huge leap down to the secret passage where we signaled a Kuro. This triggers another cutscene that we skip, after which we concuss ourselves by hitting our head on the ceiling a few times in the name of moving slightly faster in this area where we can't sprint. At the end of the tunnel, we emerge into a silver grass field and trigger another cutscene, leading to a fight against Genichiro. This fight has the same outcome whether you win or lose, so for the sake of speed, we just take the L immediately and skip the cutscene. We awake with a shinobi prosthetic arm installed in place of our left arm, so we must have gotten pretty fucked up in the cutscene we skipped. The prosthetic gives us the Spider-Man ability, letting us traverse most of the map and enter the first real area of the game, Ashina Outskirts. In the outskirts, we're going to run by an item that we pick up which gives us more ash. As I said earlier, this is a speedrun to complete the game with a Shura ending, which is one of four possible endings, and is also the earliest in the game. In order to complete the Shura ending, we need to obtain three key items, the Shelter Stone, the Lotus of the Palace, and the Mortal Blade. Once we get those three items, we're able to obey the Iron Code to face the final bosses. Of the three items we need, we're first going to go for the Shelter Stone. Once we beat the boss guarding the stone, we get the Mibu Breathing Technique, which lets us perform the glitch I mentioned earlier called Air Swimming. To get there though, we have to go through several areas which contain bosses that are normally not optional. The first of those bosses is the Chained Ogre right here, but we're able to make the Ogre optional with a trick called Ogre Skip. Watch how Aggie is able to jump here after he falls off the ledge. This is often referred to as a delayed jump, and it allows us to jump around the corner of the building and then double jump off of a wall to ledge grab and bypass the ogre fight. Like in real life, in Sekiro, you normally have to be in contact with something to be able to jump, you know, like something to push off of with your legs. However, if you drop off of a ledge and jump with incredibly precise timing, you'll jump as you're falling off the ledge, allowing you to get extra distance on your jump. Despite looking relatively simple, Ogre Skip is actually the hardest part of the entire run. With the Ogre out of the way, we head towards a large canyon where you normally encounter the Great Serpent. If you're unfamiliar, the Great Serpent is a set-piece boss that focuses on stealth, but sneaking is slow, so Aggie is going to just sprint through the whole thing. At one point, we perform another really hard and precise trick called Canyon Skip, wherein we skip having to go through a slow wall-hugging section by double jumping off of some icicles. 
After Canyon Skip, the snake tries to attack us, but by that point, our escape is pretty much secured. When we emerge from the canyon, we arrive at Ashina Castle, where we grab a Gatins. sugar that we save for later. We then head over to the arena for the boss fight against where we run around a specific bonfire to spawn the boss with a specific pattern and then hear him loudly proclaim his name in Spanish. We then perform a skip for this boss called Horse Skip, where we climb a tower and perform a delayed jump off of it to ledge grab on a perimeter wall to be able to exit the arena. Aggie then stands on top of the gate rooftop to for sure bait Hubu. off of the cliff. This counts as beating the boss and gives us the Shinobi execution message, which also gives us the memory for Hubu. and also the mechanical barrel, the latter of which we won't be using during this run. Shortly after that boss skip, we begin the next boss skip, which is called Bull Skip, because of the fact it skips the Blazing Bull fight, which is another fight you're normally not able to skip. By climbing on top of this tower, we can then double jump off of a tree to land on top of some perimeter walls that are technically out of the playable area. This jump to out of bounds is one of the things that got patched out, which is why we play on version 1.02. Aggie can then just run past the Blazing Bull Arena and jump down, Spider-Manning up to a bridge where we'll discover a Sculptor's Idol. Here, we confront the memory of Hubu to increase our attack power, which makes future boss fights that we don't skip faster. Leaving the idol, Aggie is going to run across a bridge and then make a huge leap where he'll then double jump off of a cliff face and Spider-Man up into a Sheena Reservoir. This is the area where we started the game, but now that we have the Shinobi prosthetic, we can enter a new area from here. First though, we have to actually fight and defeat our first enemy of the game, a mini boss named Lone Shadow Long Swordsman. If you're unfamiliar with how combat works in Sekiro, the quickest way to explain it is that enemies have a health bar and a posture bar, with the health bar in the top left corner and posture being in the top middle of the screen. As you attack and hit an enemy, it depletes their health and also builds up a little bit of posture. As you block an enemy's attacks with perfect timing, it deflects their attack and builds up their posture bar as well. Either bring an enemy's health bar to zero, or build up an enemy's posture bar to the max, and you can perform a death blow. Normally, enemies take one death blow to kill. However, bosses and mini-bosses can take multiple, as indicated by the number of circles in the top left corner above their health bar. Death blows can also be performed by attacking an unsuspecting enemy from either above or behind, like how we did at the start of the Lone Shadow fight, and immediately remove one of their health icons. You may have noticed that when we killed Lone Shadow, that Aggie held the X button on his Xbox controller to absorb the scent from their body so that we can spend it later. Aggie then makes an enormous drop down towards the Ashina Depths, where he will then grab another bag of ash. Now, you may be wondering, why do we need to get so much ash? To that, I say, stop asking questions, we'll get there when we get there. Right now, Aggie needs to take out a sniper with a death blow from above because we're about to fight Snake Eyes. Shirahagi. For this fight, we're going to death blow once from behind, get Snake Eyes into a corner, and then perform what's called dead angling. This is where you don't necessarily face the enemy while you attack, but your sword still hits them even though they're to your side. When you do this, your enemy is unable to block your attacks, allowing you to get a ton of free posture buildup on them. Snake Eyes will still occasionally try to hook us with their weapon, so we still have to block those on occasion, but other than that, this boss fight is pretty straightforward. The reason why we killed that sniper moments ago was to ensure that we wouldn't get shot while doing this, which would slow down or mess up the fight. Aggie then runs through the disappearing fog wall, collecting the Sen from Snake Eye's body in the process. We then run through a boss arena where we would normally fight the second iteration of a certain boss, however, because we haven't fought that certain boss yet, the second iteration doesn't spawn, leaving this place empty save for a few spots where we can Spider-Man up to bring us to the hidden forest. Here, we're going to run along some trees, avoiding a large black cock that can really fuck you up if it hits you, and then we'll drop down to grab a sugar. This sugar halves our max vitality and posture while giving us a sizable boost to attack power, but we're gonna save it for later. 
We also then run over to another item that we pick up, which are snap seeds. The primary use of snap seeds are to break the effect of an enemy's illusion technique, and they come in handy in an upcoming boss fight, but we'll get there shortly. Normally in this area, you have to go through a minor detour to face off against Tokujiro. the glutton. This would lead us to an elevated section, allowing us to enter the temple to fight the Mist Noble. Instead, with some precise movement, Aggie is able to double jump off of a tree, land on a specific branch, and then jump straight to the temple to body the fuck out of the noble. This boss is so easy that on most websites that lay out strategies for bosses and mini bosses, just say to hit him and that's it. With the Mist Noble defeated and the fog clearing, we run to the now cleared area and make a huge leap down towards the Mibu Village. Spider Manning a branch at the last second did not take fall damage. Mibu Village proper is a pretty straightforward section that consists of mainly just running past all the enemies. We'll eventually make it to a river that we'll swim up, and from there, we'll Spider-Man up onto a bridge. This all is leading up to the boss from whom we receive the Mibu breathing technique. The boss in question is the Corrupted Monk, and what we're about to do to it is illegal according to the 8th Amendment because it's going to be cruel and unusual. We're going to be using some items in this fight, meaning we have to menu a bit to equip them, so to minimize menuing, we're going to not only equip the two items used in this fight, but all four items that we'll be using for the remainder of the run. The boss doesn't spawn until we enter the center of the arena, so we're going to initially skirt along the perimeter to get behind the boss when it spawns, so that it doesn't know we're there since we're not in its line of sight. When we eventually spawn the boss and the fight begins, we're going to then use Snap Seed three times and throw Ash on the Monk five times. Each time we use one of these items on the boss, it'll get stunned for a moment and stagger slightly backwards. After the final use of our Pocket Ash, we will still be undetected and the Monk will have staggered far enough backwards to be within range of us to jump onto it from above by double jumping off of a stone pillar. We can then do a Stealth Death Blow on the Monk from above, instantly killing it. After killing the boss, and as soon as the shinobi execution message pops up, Aggie quits to the main menu and reloads his game, which causes for the stone door to instantly open. We then get pop-ups notifying us that we've received the Mibu breathing technique, as well as a memory for the corrupted monk, which we'll confront in a bit. Once we grab the Shelter Stone, we choose to get sent back to our last communed idol to return to the Sheena Castle, and it's now time to break the game wide open. When we arrive at the castle, we're going to head over to a bridge where we'll jump on top of a wall, followed by jumping towards the castle and double jumping into a big hole in the collision of the wall. This puts us out of bounds, where we then jump down into some water that exists in the void. We now pretty much have free reign over the game world, being able to just swim to wherever we want, regardless of if there is water normally in a place we're at. This is why it's called air swimming, because by diving underwater in this out of bounds area, we can pretty much swim in the air. The main issue with this glitch though is that you still have to access the areas in the order that you would normally go through them while in bounds. If you don't, there's a good chance the game will crash or kill you via death planes which is obviously bad. To make sure the game loads the areas in the correct order, we have to go near the surface in some spots and also surface in the abandoned dungeon. This is then followed up by quitting to the main menu to ensure everything loads properly, but once we do that, we can air swim to and through Temple. temple. At one point coming up, we're going to cancel our air swim by swimming into some actual water and then resurfacing, which breaks the air swim and allows us to move and interact with things normally, which is required since we're heading towards an idol. On our way to the idol, we're going to perform something called aggro chain. This begins by swimming near an enemy, which puts us in combat. Whenever we enter combat, the game makes a checkpoint to the exact location where we were upon entering combat. As long as we stay in combat, the game will retain that original location as our checkpoint spot. By remaining in combat, when we eventually quit to the main menu and load the game, we will be back at the exact checkpoint location from before aggroing any enemies. This is abused by continuing to swim near more and more enemies on our way to discover an idol so that we stay in combat, meaning that our checkpoint never gets updated. 
When we finally discover the idol, we quit to the main menu and continue the game, and we'll be back at the checkpoint, but the idol will still be discovered so we can travel back to it later. Because we're also air swimming when we originally hit the checkpoint, we'll be air swimming again when we load the game. We then air swim down towards the Sunken Valley Passage, which is where what is probably the most iconic boss in the game is located, the Guardian Ape. The ape guards the Lotus of the Palace, which is one of the three items we need to complete the Shura ending, the other two being the Mortal Blade and the Shelter Stone, the latter of which we already have. Instead of fighting the ape though, Aggie is going to perform some precise out of bounds that begins with a really scary jump to get back inbounds. This jump is actually so tough that Aggie switches to a mouse and keyboard to perform the directional movements with increased precision. This whole section though is filled with difficult and risky movement, accentuated by the fact that the ape can throw its literal shit at us which is not very ideal. After a difficult battle with not only the tough movement but with the camera as well, we're able to interact with and grab the lotus, and then use the homeward idol to go back to the idol we discovered at Temple. Temple. From one primate to another, we're now going to perform a skip to get to the folding screen monkeys fight, which is required to unlock the inner sanctum location, which is where we get the mortal blade. The Folding Screen Monkeys Arena is actually loaded underneath the map we're on, so after using a sugar to make us harder to detect, Aggie performs a double jump off of a tree to clip into some rocks and drop underneath the map. As we fall, we'll eventually be prompted with the ability to Spider-Man, which puts us into the actual boss arena. This fight consists of four different enemies and is usually a test of your ability to problem solve and stealth around. Three of the monkeys represent the three wise monkeys who embody the proverb see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, with there being a fourth monkey representing the do no evil monkey from the Analex of Confucius. The monkey wearing green has really good hearing and will hear you from far away but has poor vision. The monkey wearing orange has both poor hearing and vision but is very loud and will alert the other monkeys to your presence if it detects you. The monkey wearing purple has really good vision and will see you from far away but has poor hearing. The fourth monkey is invisible, as it's often forgotten today when the proverb is referenced. Because we use the sugar, none of the monkeys were able to detect us in time as Aggie takes out the hear no evil monkey, followed by the speak no evil monkey, then the do no evil monkey, and lastly the see no evil monkey. With the monkeys taken care of, we're then brought to the inner sanctum. As I said earlier, this is where we get the mortal blade and we can actually get it now. However, there's currently a boss waiting to fight us in the same arena where we fight the final boss, which is normally required to be defeated first in order to access the folding screen monkeys fight. Grabbing the mortal blade now without evicting the first boss who's waiting for us makes everything get crossed up and softlocks the game. While we were at the sanctum, we bought some spirit emblems with the sen we've been picking up, and we confronted the memories of the monk and monkeys to increase our attack power before we traveled back to Ashina Castle. We now have to climb up the castle to get to the very top where a familiar foe will be waiting for us. Rather than climbing though, we're just going to air swim all the way back up to the top to trigger the cutscene, which removes our air swim and begins our rematch against Genichiro, the guy who gave us a battlefield amputation earlier. The fight will go down similarly to our fight against Snake Eyes earlier. Right away, Aggie will bait him into a corner by jumping over him when he's trying to attack us. Aggie then is going to dead angle Genichiro and attack with a specific cadence to get the same attack animation over and over, ensuring that our blade actually connects with him. Genichiro is pretty much helpless, although on occasion he can attack us with his bow. This causes us to lose a little bit of time but is no issue because we can just pick right back up with our attacks.
Once we've death blown Genichiro twice, he goes into his third phase where he can attack us with lightning. Right away, we use a of sugar to increase our posture damage and half our health and then begin our fight against Genichiro. In this fight, we pretty much just attack non-stop and deflect Genichiro's lightning attacks back at him whenever he uses them. With perfect RNG, he'll use it twice right away, letting us kill him quickly. After we defeat our nemesis, we then use the newly spawned idol to confront the memory we just received and then return to the sanctum where we'll finally receive the mortal blade. The mortal blade isn't purely aesthetic though, we also receive the mortal draw combat art with it which we will then equip. This combat art is why we bought spirit emblems a bit ago, as we're going to be using it in the final boss fight. The emblems aren't required to actually perform the attack, but if we don't have any then the attack will do less damage. Having received the Mortal Blade, the game world enters a new state as the story is progressing, meaning that we can only fast travel back to one select idol in Ashina Castle even if we never actually got that idol earlier. Luckily though, this idol is near to this spot where we trigger Air Swim, so we can just run by some enemies to set that up and swim back up to the top of the castle. There, we're going to be reunited with our surprisingly alive adoptive father, Owl. I know it's a little late into the run, but here's a super brief lore rundown. The main goal of the game is to collect all three items from earlier which are required to perform the Immortal Severance ritual so that we can remove Kuro's dragon heritage so no one will fight over him anymore to gain immortality. As a shinobi we serve two people, our father Owl and our master Kuro. According to the Iron Code, the parent is absolute and we must obey them over all else, despite the fact that our father is trying to obtain the dragon heritage from Kuro to become immortal. If we choose to obey the Iron Code, that leads to the Shura ending, where we fight the two people who protect Kuro from our betrayal. This being a Shura ending run, we obviously choose to betray Kuro and obey the Iron Code, which leads to two final boss fights. The first fight is against Emma, the Gentle Blade, but don't let her name fool you, Emma is spooky. Right away in our fight with her, we use a sugar. For the most part, this fight consists of mostly alternating attacks and deflections which keeps Emma in a rhythm and typically prevents her from going from spooky to super spooky. Sometimes though, the rhythm will be broken and Aggie will have to wait for her to attack again, losing us precious seconds, however that didn't happen here. Once we finally built up her posture all the way, we can deliver her a death blow where she spits an insult in our face with her dying breath. This leads us into the final fight of the game, and we pop another sugar right before the cutscene before it. This fight is against Ishin Ashina, and is more of an actual fight than any of the other ones. Aggie will keep up the pressure whenever possible to build up Ishin's posture and have to dodge some attacks like the one you're supposed to normally use the Makiri counter for which we never attain the skill book of. Sometimes, Ishin will charge up a super strong move, which is when we use the Mortal Draw combat art to interrupt them, after which we go right back to attacking. He only does this attack during his second health bar though, and it will always be the first attack he uses in that phase. Once we're able to fully build up and break his posture twice, and deliver the final death blow, the fight is over. The run officially ends when the credits begin playing. If you made it to the end of this video, I'd like to say thank you on both Aggie's and my own behalf. Aggie is an awesome dude who I got to spend a fair amount of time with at AGDQ and he helped me a ton with making this video. I can't recommend enough that you guys go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Also, thank you to those of you who have chosen to support the channel on Patreon. It makes a world of difference and while it's completely unnecessary, you all choose to support anyways and that means a lot. 
I hope you all, patron or not, enjoyed this run, and if you have any feedback on it or recommendations for other runs to cover or videos to make, I recommend you join my Discord and head over to the video discussion and recommendation channels, link is in the description. This was a Shura ending speedrun of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.